pleasant morning to everyone. We are <clears throat> very glad that you have joined us today in worship, and we trust that your hearts have been blessed so far. I think the worship team did very well on, on the songs today. Can we show them some appreciation? And um, as an addendum to our MEO, we would just like to recognize those who participated in Feed 500 yesterday. So if you were a volunteer yesterday, we invite you to stand. We had over 20 volunteers. Let's see all our volunteers from Feed 500 yesterday. And let's give them an appreciation. Applause. God bless you and thank you. Um, there are a couple of us who really, really wanted to be there. Devon and I really, really wanted to be there. But we had all the instructions. And um, when we get those instructions, we comply. Devon and I comply. We continue in our series today, um, A Season of Hope. Last week we spoke about a reason for hope. This week we talk about a hope for everyone. A hope for everyone. And um, the passage is in Isaiah 61, 1 to 7. <clears throat> um, but before we get into this passage, I would like, we're going to do something today. Um, so, how many people have traveled to caves or islets where when you get there, that's it, you're stuck? Anybody? It may be sulky. <laughs> yeah, if your boat leaves you in sulky, you're in sulky. I go there often. I love it. I love it. Or Fort George Key. All the fellas, all the brethren who were in Fort George Key earlier this year. Just imagine yourself on an island. And the boat left. No airport, just boat. And then you're told, well, the boat isn't coming back. The original boat isn't coming back. And the one that's coming can only hold a third of the original capacity. 60 of us out there both can hold all 20 people. Which 20 going to go? So, so, I have selected one person that I don't mind staying back with me to pull the names. To pull the names. So what's going to happen is, Brother Devon is going to come. He's going to pull one of the papers in my hand. He doesn't know what the papers, the papers just have numbers. He hasn't seen it. So if there are any auditors in the room, feel free to to do the audit. Um, it's a transparent process. He's going to pull a number and then on the screen will let, a set of letters will appear. We're not doing magic, all right? We're pressing buttons. If your name ends with one of the letters you see on the screen, you stand. And you know what standing means, right? You're getting out of here. <laughs> Instructions clear? Take a minute to respell your name, please. <laughs> your first name we are known by. Not, not that middle name that nobody has ever heard. Please. Santana. We don't know you as Santana Kenyatta. We know you as Kenyatta. Oh, try that. M-A-R-C-U-S. is Marcus. That's my name. My last letter is S. If S show up, I go on. <laughs> Ready? You spell your name? You know it's spelling? What, you have the last letter in your head? Yes. Brother D? Yes. Let's see who we keep with us. All right. Taking the one at the top. <laughs> Can I see the number? One. Where's that loud, you know? Number one. All right. Let's see the letters. If your name ends with this letter, stand. You going to? <laughs> How many people standing? One, two, three, one, five, six, twelve. Twenty-seven. The rapture. The rapture. <laughs> Jermaine, you're lucky. You get your son to go with you. All right. Let's give those that standing a, a, an applause. If you care. If you care to. 
Thank, th yeah, I know. Thank you for participating. Thank you for participating. Everybody else, you stuck on the island. You know the worst part to this? You know the worst part to this? Devon's name. N. So Devon gone. And I called the brother because I wouldn't mind. I want him to stay back with me. So let him show up. He's gone. Awesome! <laughs> awesome! I did. Ah. Hallelujah! <laughs> now, hello. For transparency purposes, we did not plan this, all right? This is pure luck of the draw. Because you know what our title for our message is today? A hope for everyone. A hope for everyone. A while ago we were in trouble. We were depending on the luck of the draw. But Isaiah 61 tells us and gives us a hope for everyone. Let's examine this passage and two main points from it today. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison for those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called oaks of righteousness. The planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastation. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many ge generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. And they shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in your glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. Last week in the book of Isaiah 9, we, we saw how the children of Israel, through their sin and as a result of their sinful practices, brought the judgment of God upon them. As we go through the book of Isaiah, we see a clear prophetic word of God saying to his children, because you have forsaken me, and the language I used last week was that you have traded me for things of less value. Calves made with golden images. Therefore, as a just God, I will bring judgment on you. The judgment that God brought had dire consequences for the children of Israel as the Assyrians captured them. And later on in Isaiah, the Babylonians in 597 BC came and conquered them. I said last week that what the children of Israel inherited as a blessing could not be enjoyed because they became enslaved in the very place that God had blessed them with. Simply because of sin. Do you know sometimes we can miss out on the blessing and enjoy the blessings that God has given us because we are locked up in things like unforgiveness and we are locked up in things of bitterness and we can lock up complaining so that while we are being blessed by God, we are not enjoying it because we are in a totally different state of mind and we are not in alignment with his word and with his will and therefore we are not enjoying the blessing. But in Israel's case, they were enslaved and they were captive in the very place that Joshua and the, and the other people had fought for and conquered. 
The impact of God's judgment was felt at the national level as the children of Israel no longer ruled the land. They were broken and shattered people. As their identity was being diluted by the influx of interrelationships and the influx of other tribes and other nations and other people. But more importantly, I suggest to us that the impact was not only felt at the macro level, at the national level, but it was felt at the family level. And it was felt at the individual level. You see, when the light of hope is dimming, the impact is felt at the individual level in ways that it is not felt at the national level. When hope is dimming, there are particular demographics that feel the pressure more than others. Because even in crisis, people differentiate and distinguish themselves. Even in a crisis, even in a famine, there are those who always seem to get the food. You don't believe me? You, you experience a post hurricane situation where there is a shortage of everything, but you go at some homes and there are all kinds of plastic bags <laughs> because they know somebody who knows somebody who is sharing the food and they get favored. And then you walk down the road and there is a family struggling. Even in crisis, even in family in challenging times it is disproportionate the suffering is disproportionate and so is the resolution same thing in the days of the children of Israel but I want you to look deep into Isaiah 61 with me because as I went into this passage over the past two weeks preparing I found some powerful adjectives just describing the state not just of the of the nation but of the individual you will see words like broken-heartedness. You will see words like captive. You will see words like bond in that passage, which reflect not just the state of the nation, but the condition of the individual. You will recognize that what they were going through as a result of the error of the sin of their forefathers and of their own sin was very hard on them. But might I also suggest to us that what we see described in Isaiah 61 reflects in many ways our experiences. What we see described in Isaiah 61 mirrors in many senses my experiences and probably your experiences of broken heartedness and captivity and struggling and being distressed and, 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 and being infiltrated by foreign things. But what I love about Isaiah is that throughout his prophetic word of judgment, El Rakum, the merciful God, remains in the center and central to the whole message. Isaiah is giving and sending a message of hope, a powerful yet simple prophetic message of salvation and redemption. In Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 2, which stands out as a general theme of the book, says this, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. You see, Isaiah name means the salvation of Yahweh. God saves. That even in the midst of national crisis and calamity, God is saying, I will send my son who will redeem you, who will save you and bring you back to himself. You see, a guy got me thinking a couple of years ago when they were discussing a, a particular topic. And, and his response in the question of strategies for how people manage in the crisis his first response was this, hope is not a strategy. He said, hope is not a strategy. They thought about it. And, and as I was preparing again, that, that I remembered that particular um, um, discussion. And I asked myself, what is hope? And you know what I recognize? Well, first in scripture, hope is a virtue. Hope is a foundational virtue. Now abideth, faith, hope. And 
love or charity. So for those who have children to be born still, you have three beautiful names. Faith, hope, and charity. And if your last name happened to be Cox, Faith, Hope, and Charity Cox. <laughs> it works for you? If your last name is Hanfield, Faith, Hope, and Charity Hanfield. Beautiful names. But virtue is a foundational, hope is a foundational virtue. But observe with me that there would be no hope for, no need for hope if there was not, no, if there was a sin. Sin, hope became a virtue and hope became foundational simply because of sin and its consequences. Because of the consequences of sin, it, it destroyed hope. Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. That was their paradise, eternal paradise. And they were put out and then there was the hope that they would have that experience again. And hope was birthed then. But as I is preaching the message of hope, you see, because you and I still live in a broken world, you and I are still broken, and we need the hope that God has given through his son, Jesus Christ, so that we can live in hope, so that we can rest in hope. And one day, by the will and grace of God, we will experience that hope when we see Jesus for ourselves as we sang. The promised one will come, not as a babe this time, but as, as the king, as a victor, riding on that horse of victory to take us unto himself. When hope will be realized and there will be no further need for hope. Isn't that wonderful news? That's wonderful news. Christ offers hope, a hope for everyone, because the sin and sin and its impact has been our experience, our collective experience. As we look into the text, I would wish to make two observations today. I wish to observe first what I call a universal problem. A universal problem. Simply put, we are a broken people. We are a broken people. Isaiah 61 begins by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news, to preach the gospel to the poor. That's how the King James puts it. Observe with me in our sinful and brokenness that we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are spiritually poor. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We are looking at the problems that's described in the text. And the first one that comes up is the, the spiritual condition of man. And it is simple. Man is spiritually dead. Proverbs reminds us that she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. That's the problem, a universal problem. We were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So that you and I, until we come into Jesus Christ, but our original state when we were born, and until we had that experience, we were spiritually dead. We were spiritually poor. We were spiritually bankrupt. The children of Israel in that state, in that captivity, were all spiritually dead. But more than that, not only were we dead, but we were held captive by sin and its addictions. Proverbs 5.22 says, The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast by the cords of his sin. Spiritually dead, and we are taken captive. You are bound. 
addicted to sin. And you just live that life of sin. One pleasure after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. Not thinking about God, not caring about anything, but just addicted and driven by the, by the lustful passions in your heart. That sinful man just drives us or drove us for those who once had that life and just drove us in a direction that was heading fast and furious to self-destruction. So when you look at Isaiah talking to the people, we see spiritual death. We see spiritual poverty. We see spiritual bankruptcy. But we also see addiction. Go back to the text. It says what? It says, proclaim liberty to the captives. You do not liberate anything that hasn't been bound. Open doors of prisons. You are in prison, whether you have done something or not, but when you're in prison, you are captive. You are under the authority and control of somebody else. You are not at liberty to do what you wish and how you wish. And sometimes you, you would seem to have a moment of pleasure, but you come right back into that, that three by three cell that reminds you that this is your life. This is the sum total of your life. One held in captive, one held in bondage. But then as we look further in the text, we see other very powerful descriptive words coming up, like those who are mourning. We see people in ashes, and sackcloth and ashes were worn, while were garments of mourning. You put on your sackcloth and your ashes, and you would walk down the road wailing and, and bawling, or sit in sackcloth with ashes on your head as an indication that you have suffered loss. You have suffered pain. You have suffered brokenness. That's the, that's the problem we are dealing with today. That's the problem the children of Israel had. And as I look into, look into the mirror, I see that this is the problem I had. Spiritually dead. Held in captive and bondage to sin. And thirdly, broken. Just broken. Emotionally broken. Broken because of failure. Personal failure. Broken because of disappointment. Broken because that hope you had and you believed that would come through is no more and it's, it's just, just disappeared. Broken because of failure of the things that meant the most to you. And that brokenness leads to a demoralized and mournful spirit, a sorrowful spirit, a heaviness of heart. That describes the condition of the one who is out of Christ. But it aptly describes the condition of the children of Israel as they felt the weight of the consequences of their sin. You see, saints of God... We choose the sins we want to indulge in and, all, and the pleasure we want to get in, but we do not choose the consequences of it. And the weight of the consequences of our sin can weigh us down so heavily that it can cause us to, to inflict injury on ourselves. It can cause us to lose our mind and, and lose our mental stability and mental faculty faculty can die, bring us into depression, can, can bring us into a very demoralized state, and we are constantly mourning. So what we see in the passage today describes the life that is out of Jesus Christ. So that you are beautifully dressed today, but broken on the inside. You may have the most secure job today, but broken on the inside. You may have the resources you need to live a comfortable life, but that, but while externally you may appear comfortable, internally you are broken and you are sorrowful and you are heavy. You dread the nights. You dread the house. You dread quiet times and quiet spaces because every of, the, of the, these scenarios uh, create for you a weight, an additional weight uh, that and at those points it feels like you are going mad, that you are losing your mind.
That's the state of the life that's out of Jesus Christ. Dead, captive, and broken. I love the way of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12 sums it up. Paul writes, he says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise. Listen to the last part of that pass of that text. Having no hope and without God in the world. That's what Ephesians 2 verse 12 says. And the question I ask you as you reflect on that verse is simply this. Does Ephesians 2 and 12 describes your past or your present? That's the question I invite you to ponder with me on. Is that a description of your past or your present? And while we, we ponder on the question that is on the screen, let me go back to the verse I just read it out, but ponder on that question on the screen. You were separated from Christ. Are you today on 11th of December as we celebrate the Christ child? Are you connected to Christ or are you separated from Christ? Are you strangers to the covenant of promise? Last week's message we saw God is a covenant keeping God. That everything God did, every mercy he shown was consistent with the covenant he made. Today, I ask you, are you without hope? Are you without God? Does Ephesians 2 and 12 reflect your past or your present? See, that's a very personal question. If you're visiting us today out of love, we ask you that question. If you Come to this church every Sunday. Out of love, we ask you that question. Because coming to this church does not equate to a yes. Relating to the elders and pastor of this church does not equate to a yes. Feeding 500 or 5,000 does not guarantee a yes to that question. And as I pointed out, I go back quickly to this point, that while the children of Israel, while the nation suffered, at an individual level, the, react, the, the consequences bore differently. And so too it is today. So while we sit in this house together and we sang those beautiful songs together and we rejoice together, you can be doing all that, but individually if God were to put on his projector where we are and the condition of our hearts, what might show? Is, is it going to show a life that is spiritually dead, captive by sin, broken, or is it going to show a life that has been redeemed? Is Ephesians 2.12 a description of your past or your present? Observe with me the universal problem. But observe with me, secondly, the El Rakum, the merciful God. You know, I, 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 I am ever overwhelmed by the mercies of God. Anybody with me on this one? Yes. Jeremiah says it this way, this way. His mercies are new every morning. The psalmist asked the question, if God had to mark iniquity, who would stand? Anybody in here would stand? I know a couple of you might be standing. Not me. Not me. Even with my St. Francis last name, Brother D. Wouldn't save me. But in his mercies, gave us our second main point for today that I ask you to consider with me what I call a glorious universal solution. Jesus. Go back to the text. The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, 
Open the prison doors to those who are bound and proclaim the year of our Lord's favor and the day of our vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn, to grant to those who are in Zion, to give them beautiful headdresses instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garments of praise instead of the spirit of righteousness, of, of heaviness, and to, to plant and establish them so that they will be called oaks of righteousness. In the midst of a calamity, Isaiah is prophesying a glorious universal solution. Hallelujah! It is not Isaiah, it is Jesus! Let the church declare that today. The glorious universal solution to the universal problem of sin and its consequences is Jesus! I love it. When, when the Bible, in, in, in somewhere in Matthew, it talks about Solomon and his greatness and his wisdom and his power. And it ends by saying, somebody greater than Solomon is here. Abraham was the, 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 the father of all nations. The covenant was made with him. He is revered in history. We recognize him as the man of faith. But hello church, somebody greater than Abraham is here. Moses, the greatest of all leaders, in my estimation. I love Moses. Great fellow. Led over a million plus people. Took the stress and the strain. Got vexed. Strike rocks. Did all kinds of drama. Trying to keep himself together. And to lead these stubborn people. I always say, you know, Moses had a couple of Dominicans in that group. I can tell you, I can guarantee you, there are a couple of Dominicans there. Stubborn. Yeah, yeah, for real, for real. I know a couple of Dominicans that were there. Giving Moses trouble. Yeah? And as, and as great as Moses was, somebody greater than Moses is here. And his name is Jesus. Let the church rejoice today. He is the universal solution. He is the universal solution. Let's follow with me on a few points around that. His name, Isaiah 7 and verse 14. Isaiah prophesying. This is what he says. We saw it last week and I'm repeating. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Let's say that church, his name shall be called Emmanuel. Isaiah 9 and 6, we were there last week, our text. For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His name. Israel wasn't captive in their homeland. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, it appears everybody was taking advantage of them. You know who they, you know what they were looking for? That hero. That deliverer. And they were looking for somebody who would rise up like Gideon. Who would rise up like Joshua and defeat the enemies for them. But you see, God had a bigger plan. And God's plan was to redeem man spiritually back to himself. And not just Israel, but the nation. Remember the covenant he made with Abraham? Through you, all the nations on the earth shall be blessed. The glorious universal solution, Jesus. But not only do we see his name, but we see the duration of his kingdom. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, it is an eternal kingdom. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and even forevermore. You know, observe with me this. That Isaiah, that at the time Isaiah is writing, the kingdoms are divided two and ten. 
the northern kingdom made up of ten, and the southern kingdom made up of Judah and one of the nation. As Isaiah prophesies, he goes to the pre-division time. He, he talks about the throne of David. When David's throne was established, the nation was one. It was a united people. So that he's saying that Jesus, who is in that lineage of David, when he comes, he's not coming to lead a divided people. He's coming to lead a united church. One church, one ecclesiasticus, a holy church of the called out ones from every tongue and every nation and every language and every people will constitute that new church and will be part of the glorious kingdom of God that is an eternal kingdom. And for those of you who were in crisis, the, the children of Israel who knew and who understood their history would have, would have wondered about that. David? But that's a long time ago. How is that going to happen? You mean our nation will come back together again? I, the Lord, will perform it. His name is the duration of his kingdom. His authority. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel the authority the spirit of the lord god the giver and sustainer of hope is jesus but not only do we see the person who he is and what isaiah teaches us but lastly we see his purpose you see isaiah in his prophecy is developmental he starts by giving us his name then the next portion, he gives us more than his name. He gives us more of his, of his life and work. And then he comes to his glorious, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his glorious ascension and return. Isaiah prophesies the entire life of Jesus. The full life cycle of Jesus is in Isaiah. He gives us his purpose. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. Because of the purpose. Here is the purpose. The purpose is to redeem and reconcile us back to God. Through the preaching of the gospel. You see, saints of God, a redemptive work begins with a resurrecting of a dead spirit. And the resurrecting of the dead spirit is done through the preaching of the gospel. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Ephesians 2, 5 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And He raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Colossians 1, 13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sin. Sins and those who have never trusted him. Here is the purpose of Jesus' is coming. To preach the gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died. Buried, rose again for your sin, for your redemption, for your justification. And that by believing in him, you have life everlasting. Simple. Simple. This is not geometry. Those of us who... Did school on any level of engineering. This is not differentiation and integration. And so Pastor Kenya had a poor math skills, doesn't matter. <laughs> he declared that. He says he's a bad, ma bad math fellow. He said he learned math on a Sunday. <laughs> Anything you learn on a Sunday is, is church, is Sunday school, right? I don't know where he was Monday to Friday. But Sunday, you learn maths. Some of us learn maths Monday to Friday. And we differentiate and we integrate and we do all kinds of things. The gospel is simpler. Some of you are brilliant in your field. Medical, um, nutrition, and English, and everything. Hallelujah, the gospel is simpler than that. 
It is, it is the, the gospel, Paul says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the first and foremost act that must be done in your life. It must be done. The, the reconciliation of your life, the resurrection of your spirit must happen first for the other things to happen. You see, a lot of people want their hearts to be mended. They want their spirits to be lifted. They want the benefits that the Christian life affords without the relationship. It does not work so. You need the relationship first and then the benefits. Because here's why. The benefits are only temporary. They only belong to this life. But when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, one day we will part this life. But Paul's words ring true. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You will have that hope of, the, of resurrecting one day. And no devil in hell can interfere with that hope. It is a deal that signed and sealed by the Holy Spirit. So today the most important thing to have is that relationship with Jesus Christ. The benefits will come, but the relationship is the core, is the foundation. He has come to preach the gospel to the poor. And if you do not know Jesus Christ spiritually, you're poor. And the IMF cannot help you. There is no poverty alleviation program to rescue you. Only the power of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, that can cleanse you from all sin. And that will change you from being poor to being rich in Jesus Christ. I love what James writes uh, when he writes. He says, those who are, are low are brought up in Jesus. And those who are wealthy are brought down to Jesus. In Jesus, we are all reconciled. That's the most important thing today. And when you know Jesus, the next part follows as we close. The, the healing of your life. The mending of your brokenness will begin. You see, it's a process. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, he starts, he saves you, that's complete. Let me repeat that. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that experience is written in the Bible, in the Greek past tense. It is an experience you have and it is complete. You are saved. Full stop. You're not saved. Committee <laughs> must review the application. Then you are second phase saved. And then it goes to the final authority. And if you pass, then you're finally saved. No. No. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you are, let's say it together, you are saved. Full stop. Those of you who love committees, I'm sorry for you. There is no committee stage in this business. Hallelujah. Because I would be in trouble. Because somebody on that committee would know my family. And know my history. And I may have offended them and upset them or owe them some money. And my name would not be approved. But the approval is done in heaven instantaneously. Hallelujah. And then he bends the heart. He gives you a joy. He gives you a joy. He gives you a peace. He begins to heal your heart and your being in a way that you don't even understand what's happening. He brings a deliverance over things. As you continue to pray and believe him, and he delivers you and you wake up one day and realize, but this, this thing is gone. This stress is no more. This problem does not exist again. How I feel so different. You know, you know it, it, is a, it is a work of faith. It is a work of grace. It is a mysterious work. But hallelujah, it is a work that is evidence-based. Because we know it. We feel it. We express it. And let me tell you something I can't explain. That joy that I have. I can't explain the 
peace that God gives and has given me. I can't explain so many things. And I'm not even going to try. I know for a fact that it is the power of God working in me. Only because I've trusted him. And the only thing I do is praise. That's what I do is praise. You can experience that in your life today. The healing and the restoration. But it starts with the redemption. It starts with the redemption. This is how I end today. On the screen you will see Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Then Jesus of Nazareth, when he had been brought up, and was in his, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the Isaiah the prophet was given to him. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all of the eyes and all eyes and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say this. Let's read that together. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is how we end today. This scripture can be fulfilled in your heart. Isaiah prophesied it. Luke writes the fulfillment of it. But hallelujah, that work is still going on. Because that scripture was fulfilled in my heart some 39 years ago when I gave my heart to the Lord. That scripture was fulfilled in your heart. Some of you, 40 years ago. Some of you, 25 years ago. Some of you, 15 years ago. Some of you, 5 years ago. Some of you, 10 years ago. Some of you, 2 years ago. Some of you, 6 months ago. Some of you, nine, um, 6 weeks ago. But hallelujah, hallelujah. Today can be your day one. It can be fulfilled in your heart today. We bow. Father, we commit this word to you. And we ask in Jesus' name that you will speak to our heart, speak to our life. With all eyes bow and all eyes closed, we give opportunity today. As our worship team gets ready to sing. You may be visiting today. You may be a part of our church. Like I said, it's not a pre-qualification. It's good. It allows you to hear the gospel. But the decision to serve Jesus Christ is one that is in response to the bidding of the Holy Spirit. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ today and you walked in there broken, you walked in there in captive, you have an option now to just stand where you are and one of our elders will come and pray with you. And per adventure, you feel a little bit intimidated by the atmosphere. That's okay. At the end of the service, feel free to look out for Pastor Kenyatta, Pastor Caldon, myself, or any member of church, dog, any one of us, and just say, I've heard the word today and I would like to receive Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. But we give opportunity now. Because it's a hope for everyone. A hope for everyone. And you are part of that hope. As the worship team sings, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, feel free to stand. Feel free to leave your seat and just come and stand up to the altar for prayer. And if you're a believer today and you're struggling with your faith and you need prayer support, as the worship team sings, just leave where you are and just come and stand at the altar. One of us will come to pray with you. But we give you opportunity. There is a hope for everyone. You may not have gotten on that boat with us at the start of the service, but you can get on the boat to heaven at the end of the service by giving Jesus Christ your life.